Hello, and welcome to .NET Community Clan Stand Up Cloud Style. Uh, my name is Andrew Hall, and today I have with me Phil Allen. I'm one of the engineers on the Cloud Tools team. So yeah, I've probably seen me before, but I'm the program manager lead for uh, tooling out of the ships out of the .NET organization, which includes web and app service tooling, as well as the core stuff like project systems, refactorings, all the stuff that makes your life great and pleasant as developers in Visual Studio. And Phil uh, spends most of his time working on our app service tooling in Visual Studio. Uh, so today, we have a couple things queued up for you. We're going to chat about two topics in particular. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, starting from some blog posts I found from members of our community talking about uh, Cosmos DB. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting right, new database newish database technology that's Absolutely. a little different than traditional SQL. And then we'll spend probably the majority of time at the end talking about Docker containers. What are they? Why are they interesting? And how would you get started with them in uh, some of our tools? So with that, let's flip over to uh, kind of this blog post that I found. And so uh, this is a blog post talking about uh, the new Cosmos DB SDK. And as a starting point, Phil, um, tell me, talk to me a little about what is Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is, <clears throat> um, d depending upon what level you're looking at it, it's a storage technology that exists in Azure. And it's best known for its NoSQL approach to doing things. So this is non-relational data. Uh, there's a few other providers out there. Uh, you can do uh, similar things in the traditional storage accounts in Azure too, but this is a more scalable, more automatically indexable way of doing things. Okay, talk to me a little bit more about that. I've read the term NoSQL is kind of hot, but uh, obviously SQL databases have been around forever. But what does it really mean for me as a developer perspective um, to work with a NoSQL or non-relational database? So when you work with, a, we'll start with what a relational database you get. You set up uh, one table here and one table there, and you set up joins between them. And when you want to do queries, you can do arbitrary queries against them. And there's also locking semantics that come with that, because if you're changing a table that has a reference to an item in another table, there's certain things that come along with that to make sure that the database holds its integrity. With NoSQL, you can have multiple tables, but they're not so strongly bound together. And you can often get much better performance out of it because of the no need to do all of that locking and a bunch of other things that come along with it. Uh, but uh, you have to think about what you will want to query in the future before you lay out your data, because you can't just uh, assume that there's an adjacent item in another uh, storage table. Right, thanks. Um, yeah, so if I kind of scroll down, I think one of the interesting things, one of the other really interesting things that uh, he walks through in this blog post talking about uh, Cosmos DB is when you look at using the things, so tr in traditional relational data, there's a very strong schema that's stored with the table, in, right? So when I mm -hmm. lay out my table, and then, which doesn't always map perfectly to the uh, way I'd want to use objects in my code in C Sharp. And so that's mm -hmm. why we created uh, called Object Relational Mappings, or ORM systems, Entity Framework, of course, being the most popular one in .NET land, but there are many others as well. Mm -hmm. And um, right, so there's sort of this like we abstraction layer that we have to put in between our code and the database to get things to work together correctly as a programmer. I think one of the more interesting things about NoSQL tables is because they're schema. And then so, right, if, if for example, if I decide that I want to add a new column to my database mm -hmm. because my thing needs, uh, my application needs more data on an object, I then have to you know go update those tables and get the database where that's going to be stored updated in order to read and write to that. Right. So if I try to write a, to a table or a column that doesn't exist, I'm going to get an error. Right, it's going to say this doesn't exist. You can't do that without actually going in and updating the schema of the database. Yep. I think one of the more interesting things from a programmer's perspective as well that makes working with a NoSQL database like Cosmos um, really, really interesting is because it's schemaless on any given object, as I go, I can continue to build up my. I need a new column, great, just add a new property to the object, just write the object into the Cosmos table, and it's just going to work. I'm not going to get an error. 
Correct. Um, you can do some. You can do a, effectively a lazy upgrade as opposed to having some amount of uh, downtime while you're updating the schema uh, or read-only state. Or there's a number of ways you could do it with uh, relational. With non-relational, you just add the property. You default the property. Oh, the property's not there. It acts like X, and therefore you can uh, adapt from there. Yeah, and so in this blog post, I think it does a good job. Right? So this person has created this uh, object called test entity. Mm -hmm. And so we just add some stuff, and then he writes it. And then I said in the future, it would be just as easy as adding other properties. Only one, there is one scheme of requirement I should mention in Cosmos DB, <laughs> though. Um, and that is every uh, property must have an ID. Sorry, every item written into the database has to have an ID attribute. Yep. And that's just so you can look it up later, <laughs> <laughs> which makes sense. So that's the only uh, schema. And actually, so this person talked about in the new version of the SDK that they found, um, there used to be an option in the older version to auto-generate the SDK, or sorry, auto-generate the ID field. And mm -hmm. it looks like they've actually taken that away. So now it's your responsibility to actually provide a ID implementation in the object that you write into it. So they, they kind of, it's an interesting blog post. They talk about just evaluating the new SDK. And the one thing that got them was they started off by just saying var item, new test entity. They didn't provide an ID. And they got an error message back. And then the fix is actually to provide their own ID mm -hmm. to that, because now it doesn't have the ability to auto generate it. Once you actually know the ID that you wrote in, so you can look it up. Was, was the error message helpful? Did it tell them what they needed to do? And, or is this? Uh... Uh, not fully. Um, <laughs> so the error message says response code does not indicate success. Uh, reason, the input name null is invalid. Ensure to provide a unique non-empty string less than 255 characters. So okay, probably unique enough to Google, but probably not unique enough to um, infer what you needed to do implicitly from the error message. Yeah, but putting the error message into your favorite search engine is a great way to find some resolution on a number of websites. So yeah, I agree that is pretty unique. Yeah, so from a developer perspective, that's I think kind of one of the, th are there any other things that make uh, Cosmos DB or NoSQL approaches unique to maybe on the things that we've talked about at this point? Hmm. The answer can be no. I, I'm just I'm just thinking and trying to you know accumulate that all against uh, my uses of uh, NoSQL style in the past. Um, I think that covers all the the basics and all the things that you would generally um, need to know to get started. Are there any gotchas that people should be aware of? So for example, the, we talked about some benefits. Mm -hmm. Should I run out and say, you know what, I'm never creating another relational database again? Well, it really depends upon your call pattern and your ability to predict the queries you're going to need to do in the future. If you have a, an application that has uh, a very well-defined flow through it, and that therefore you can predict the queries and you can do what you need to do in order to make them run quickly so that you can scan off of the more easily indexable fields. You can do some amount of uh, denormalization, like have the same data in multiple rows with slightly different names, so you can query them different ways. If you can do all that, you can get really nice performance out of it. If you need to have something where people can do arbitrary queries against it, arbitrary queries are going to be s potentially slower, and you'll need to measure and make sure that it'll be uh, fast for the end users. Got it. So I think one of the things that I'm going to, I'm reading between the lines in what you just said, but I think one of my takeaways from that is it's perfectly acceptable for me to say in a larger application that I may have certain use cases where I would want some of that data to be in relational tables because there's going to be, like having a structured schema imposed on it is going to result in much better performance for working with that data. And there may be other types of data that I would want to put in a non-relational NoSQL database. Is that a fair? That, that's totally fair. And it's all about measuring and, and understanding the scale of the data and the types of queries. So we don't want to fall into the hammer and nail trap, right? We don't, meaning uh, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So uh, <laughs> both have, it's not that, no, that SQL and relational databases are dead. It's just that NoSQL opens up uh, new use cases for things that SQL databases or relational databases may not have been as great at before, and I had to work hard to change the shape of my data to fit it into my database. Absolutely. 
Great. Uh, one of the, any other benefits of Cosmos that you can think of? Uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm uh, one thing that you get from it being a cloud provided service as opposed to having something on your uh, premises is that you don't have to worry about the actual database maintenance. Um, you get a high degree of availability out of it, and this is true effectively because it's an Azure. Okay. You also have uh, significant SDKs and blog posts and such to help you uh, on your path to making good use of it. Got it. So the other th actually thing that I was thinking of when I asked that question is Cosmos DB automatically solves geo replication for you. So if you're trying to work with an application around the um, that's going to run in multiple regions, it will automate. You can create a Cosmos DB instance in each of the region that goes along with your website, and mm -hmm. it will handle making that data consistent between all of the regions, and it will do it very, very quickly in the order of milliseconds. So there's no let's run a job every night at 3 a.m. <laughs> to try to get our databases bulk in import sync, yeah, across all of our regions or whatever. Like. Cosmos handles it in milliseconds. There have been some really interesting Azure Friday videos where Scott Hanselman's had people from the Cosmos DB team on, mm -hmm. and they tried to force an inconsistency error. I mean, they had a script written to for try to force an error to get the data out of sync, and sometimes even the script can't get it out of sync because it gets in sync that fast across regions. Cool. Because I mean, it's, it, there are milliseconds. Like obviously, you can't move data from one location to the to the other instantly. But it is really, really fast. Like even if you're trying to break it and get it out of sync, it's actually kind of hard. Good, good, good. Um, and I had an interest. There's another interesting blog post I, I found as I was doing this. I probably should have had it queued up. Um, but it was actually the person was talking about. Let's see if we can find it. But the person was talking about um, like actually using Cosmos DB as a cache instead of Redis. And the reason for that is because Cosmos DB solves all of the eventual consistency issues so quickly, they were saying that they had, so let's see if we can find this, let's say, you know, Cosmos uh, DB um, Redis cache, and I actually had talked about it. Uh, yeah, using um, Azure Cosmos DB as your persistent uh, geo-replicated distributed cache for ASP.NET Core. Um, we won't walk through the blog post necessarily right now, but I thought it was interesting. They kind of talk about, like, Redis is very much designed for this. Mm -hmm. um, but then they talked about when they were trying to work across multiple regions, why actually Cosmos just solved a lot of those problems for them that Redis did not. And uh, the geo-replication of Redis is also only available in the higher tiers of Redis. So there's different, mm -hmm. different SKUs of the Redis cache. And so it's only available in the, in the higher SKU, whereas Cosmos will do geo-replication basically at any, any level. So. And basically what you're paying for in Cosmos is the number of transactions you can process simultaneously and the amount of data that you're storing. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing. So I think it's an interesting technology that's worth playing with and exploring. It's something that whenever I've used Cosmos, I said it really is really pleasant. I mean, if there is now an Entity Framework Core. They mm -hmm. did create an EF Core model over Cosmos if you prefer to work with Entity Framework. That came new in Core 2.2. But you don't need to, unlike SQL, where you really needed to if you wanted to work with objects in your code. Cool. So with that, I think we'll try to transition into one more technology that's been around for a little while. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not not brand new, but we haven't seen, I would say, you know, s strong mass adoption amongst the .NET customer base yet, and that is uh, Docker containers. And so what I found here is a blog post called ASP.NET Core with Docker Beginner's Guide. It's a little bit older. It's from earlier in 2018. But I thought this blog post did a really, really good job. They start with what's ASP.NET Core. We'll gloss over that in this. Um, then they talk about some of the problems that containers solve. Mm -hmm. And so can you just tell me a little bit about Kind of what is a, how do I think about a container? Is it sort of this magical thing that solves all of my problems as a developer? <laughs> if only those existed. <laughs> uh, but containers give you advantages in isolation so that you can run a number of applications on the same hardware, but that they don't interact with each other the way that they would if you 
uh, booted up a VM and installed three or four applications, they could have contention over various system resources. And so I picture containers as micro VMs with the ability to have isolation for the different apps. The apps can still use the overall system resources and they'll always compete for the same network card and the same physical CPUs, but they won't con contend over all those kernel objects in their own space. And that they won't contend with the same file system and overwrite one version of one library with another version of another library with a subtle inconsistency that only occurs if both apps are installed on the same machine. Okay, that was a lot, so I'm going to unpack <laughs> what, what you just said. <laughs> Probably could have written a master's thesis on uh, what you just put in about, uh, about, about one minute. So I think as a starting point, a Docker container really is a unit of deployment for my application. Is that a, is that a right way to think about it? So uh, I'm going to use an analogy. Obviously, it does more than that. Yep. But effectively, a Docker container takes all of my assets of my application mm -hmm. and bundles them into what is then a single file on my disk. So it's very similar to how I take all of my source code and then even potentially assets can get embedded and compiled into a single executable that I can deploy and run on another machine. Is that a fair? Totally fair. Um, another way to say it is I take everything my application depends on and I put it in a glorified zip file that mm -hmm. we call a Docker container. And as part of that, then I have the ability to, it gives me a couple of advantages, right? So one of them is, and this blog post does a really good job of outlining all of this stuff, and I think this is where you talk about isolation and things like that. So one of them in, you know, I think that will be familiar to any .NET developer has been, what do I do if I have an old application that nobody wants to fix because nobody understands anymore that doesn't work on a newer version of .NET Framework. Mm -hmm. .NET Framework is a singleton on the entire server, and so I have worked and talked to with customers who are still stuck on very old versions of .NET Framework um, because versions of some application that somebody wrote eight years ago requires .NET Framework 4.0 for example, and then they've left the company and they tried to upgrade the server to a newer version of .NET Framework and the application didn't work. Mm -hmm. Instead of debugging it, now everybody's just stuck continuing to target .NET Framework 4.0 because it's hard to upgrade the server. And so when, when you talked about isolation, one of the really interesting things about Docker containers is you actually bring everything the application needs to run in that Docker container. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about .NET framework, right, I have the ability to have a, dot, I can take that old application that nobody wants to upgrade, mm -hmm. and I can put it in a container that has .NET framework 4.0 in that container, and deploy it on the same server, where I can take another application that is going to use .NET framework 4.7.2 or 4.8, and mm -hmm. that one can have .NET framework 4.7.2 or 4.8 in that same container, and so, now what I'm doing is I'm able to you know, run those side by side on the same server. And I think the reason that's key, and I think this uh, picture does actually a really good job as I go down the blog post. Now I could have solved that before with a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the virtual machine from a size perspective is I'm bringing an entire copy of the operating system that everything needs to run it, right? So every time I have a VM or a VHD or whatever your mm -hmm. preferred technology is, Right, I'm in this place where, and this this actually picture does a really good job. I should zoom in here because um, I think it illustrates it really, really well. That's a lot of wasted space and computing power and resources on the actual metal mm -hmm. to run multiple copies of the same operating system. When the problem I'm simply trying to solve is runtime dependencies or things like that. So the idea behind a container, right, and you described this really well, so we're still unpacking <laughs> what you said, and the, this picture does a really good job of illustrating, is you're actually sharing the host OS. So the container gets to be much smaller than a virtual machine mm -hmm. because I don't have an entire copy of the guest OS in it. I just have the application and the dependencies that my application have. So even though, so I, right, if you think about .NET Framework, it's installed on Windows, so the way I would solve the problem that I just talked about with containers being like I'd have a th this guest OS would have a certain version of .NET Framework in it and the other guest OS would have a different version of .NET Framework um, but they also that's all part of Windows in the container world as we talked about 
app A has .NET Framework 4.0. And then app B has .NET Framework 4.7.2, but mm -hmm. they're sharing the exact same copy of Windows. Or in the case of .NET Core, uh, Linux containers actually can be much, much smaller than Windows containers. So if you're just looking to run .NET Core applications, uh, Linux containers are kind of generally where we'd recommend thinking about starting. But obviously, Windows containers are a great solution for what do you do with existing applications of Windows. Um, containers also have um, the ability, and I think we'll look at it here on your machine in a few minutes, but there's a file called a Docker file that defines how you build and package everything into that Docker container, mm -hmm. which means that in a cloud-centric world, right, so it was cloud stand-up, if I think about a lot of especially older ASP.NET web applications have, you know, random third-party software dependencies. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about going to a cloud like Azure, generally where I want to be is I want to be in a managed service, something like Azure App Service, mm -hmm. um, where they're taking care of managing the infrastructure for me, upgrading my OS, things like that. Um, but those managed services generally don't give you the ability to customize the environment, right? That's why it's a managed service. So if my old ASP.NET application depends on crystal reports or needs Office installed on the machine to mm -hmm. do some level of processing, I can't do that in a managed environment in Azure going to a pure managed environment. But if I put package that in a Windows container, I can install all of that software into that container and I can deploy that container onto the managed service. Mm -hmm. So containers give me also a nice way to take advantage of some of the modern cloud infrastructure while um, be still being able to get some level of customization that I may need to, especially if I'm looking at migrating older applications to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with that, uh, you can also use it kind of like a, a virtual machine image in that you have a guarantee that all those machines have exactly the same copies of all those assets, all those upstream requirements that are necessary. So if you want to deploy to like uh, Kubernetes, you give it a, a Docker image, and therefore all the machines in whatever group that is get exactly the same image. Perfect. So I think uh, we've kind of talked about generally the benefits of containers. Um, did we miss anything so far about the um, context of containers? About why they're useful, what they are, why I'd want to use them? There's nothing that springs to mind. Uh, definitely the, the benefits, the sales pitch sort of benefits have already, uh, I think that the, the, the blog post and you have got done a really good job of going into them. So um, we're going to switch over to your machine. I think I'm going to ask you the question of how would I work, if I wanted to get started with containers, if I want to play with them, if I'm mm -hmm. interested in them, um, what would I do or how would I get started with that? Um, this blog post actually does a great job. So URLs up here for anybody watching on the stream. I would probably recommend searching for the title. But um, they actually are doing it with VS Code. I think you're going to show us how to do it in uh, Visual Studio. But the one requirement that I want to call out first, because uh, they have this link here under the requirements, install Docker, is this does depend on a tool or something being installed on your operating system. It's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux, but called mm -hmm. Docker Desktop. And so it isn't just natively on the operating system. This is coming from Docker Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And so you do have to install their set of tools that understand how to build, host, and run containers. Um, great. With that, let's go ahead and switch over to uh, this machine. So uh, you're in Visual Studio. Yep. Um, so as a starting point, if I wanted, let's say I have an existing application. OK. So let's open up an existing. I might have an existing application I've already done the things to. So let's actually start with a new one. Perfect. Let's do that. Uh, but by starting with a new one, I'll actually be able to name it based upon what we're doing. So this is the Cloud Tool Standup. So Cloud Tools Stand Up. And <clears throat> we're going to go with an ASP.NET Core Web App. OK. Right, we're going to hit OK. Now, this brings us to a little piece of UI that's going to give us some choices and different templates to use, um, normal web application. And I'm going to intentionally leave this Enable Docker support 
checkbox that I'm hovering over unchecked because I want to show that experience of I have an existing application. I've been using it. I already know that it runs locally. I want to use this inside of containers. I want to try some of those things out. Well, this is going to be the same experience there, except that instead of it being your interesting application, it will be this uh, starting place sort of application. So we have this application. I'm going to pause you real quick while you're there. Sure. I think you just already answered the question. That's why I actually said, let's assume I have an existing application I want to try to containerize. So if I'm starting brand new, yep. it's as easy in Visual Studio 2017 and then Visual Studio 2019 also works the same way as checking a checkbox when I create the project that says, Dockerize this for me. Absolutely. Perfect. All right, so let's assume I have an existing application that I've been working on for a while. Yep. Um, did I miss the boat? Do I have to go do a bunch of nasty hand editing to dockerize that? Oh, I hope not. Uh, so what you need to do is, after you have the solution open, you right click on the project node. And under Add, there's a couple of options. One's called Container Orchestration Support, and the other one's called Docker Support. Uh, Container Orchestration Support gives you Kubernetes, which I kind of touched on a little bit as an option, but also Docker Compose. And then to get the same effect, you come over here, you do add, and you go like, I know I need Docker, Docker support. You get to choose between Windows and Linux. I'm going to use I'm Linux. Pause you there, one question, one second, real quick. <laughs> uh, so I think you said you, because this, you got to choose beca uh, between Windows and Linux because this is an ASP.NET Core application. Because obviously, .NET Core is capable of running either Windows or Linux. If this was a ASP.NET .NET Framework application or another .NET Framework application, it would have just picked Windows for you because .NET Framework obviously only supports Windows. So it's worth pointing cool. out. Like, we're not <laughs> limited to um, only working with .NET Core applications. It's just .NET Core. We have a choice. What is the operating system we plan to host the Docker container on, mm -hmm. whereas on um, .NET Framework, we have no choice. We, so it won't actually ask me. It'll just pick Windows Go ahead. on my behalf. Uh, cool. So uh, this produced, uh, in this particular case, because there's one project, a file called Docker file, which has a bunch of content in it that actually explains uh, how to get things uh, built and published. So this is all about that packaging. This is the starting place. Uh, there are resources online in order to figure out all the other sorts of edits you might want to make to this. Um, but having gotten this, let's actually publish this to the cloud. So oh. again, so I don't, sorry, I'm just going to pause you again and, and talk about I think a little bit of the stuff that we were talking about before, which I thought might be interesting to do within the context of this. So what you have now is you have a Docker file that's going to tell it how to build that single Docker image, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the thing misconceptions a lot of times that people have is they try to work with. Docker is part of what we would call the inner loop for regular, you know, edit, compile, debug, kind of that tight, I'm trying to get functionality working. Mm -hmm. And I think most of, you know, when we talk to a lot of our bigger customers, one of the patterns we hear is, but we talked about most of the benefits of Docker are around the idea of uh, deployment, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a single package, it, it enables isolation on the server. And so I think there shouldn't be a feeling of there's absolutely nothing wrong right, with me as a developer if I say, you know what, I'm going to do my inner loop outside the context of a container, because it is a little slower to build and, and mm -hmm. launch and start containers for part of that inner loop. And then say, you know what, obviously before this goes to production, one of the great things about Docker is because everything is compiled into a single image, the image that I would build on my local desktop machine is the same image, in theory, that would get built in the production server. Mm -hmm. And so it would be useful for me to test and make sure once if the, my operations team or we're choosing to deploy them as a container into production, that's going to be the environment that we're going to use to host it, I will obviously probably want to test it before it actually goes to production, right? And so I think that's what you're going to show here now is, hey, how would I actually test publishing this thing in a way that I could test it in a sort of broader Docker, if I have a test environment or something like that, um, without necessarily the need to have every F5 be in a container. Now, by default, it will be. Um, I'm actually going to say, if you just click the little uh, selection option up there, right? I can choose to not launch into the Docker container if I think that slows me down. But then I would still be in a position where, to your, to your point, like, hey, like now let's go ahead and publish this thing and show it. Yeah, the assumption is is that 
the normal running of the, the app before I added Docker, say it was equivalent to IIS Express or any of the other different uh, debug targets you could have there. Everything was working fine. You could um, actually uh, run Docker locally and make sure that it works there. Um, that's not what I'm in, intending to show at this moment. I'm. Uh, I'm actually going to take a question that we just ah. had come in while while we're you're doing this. And the question is, uh, why is it not possible to add Docker support for both Windows and Linux? Um, if you're listening, I'd love love for if you can kind of type. I'm going to ask a couple follow up questions. So you can clarify what you meant. Is the question why can why do you have to choose either or, or is the question that you're not seeing Linux? So if the answer, and we talked a little bit about that for .NET Framework. It only runs on Windows, and so we're always going to pick Linux. If the question is, why when you right-clicked and said add container support, was it a radio button choice, meaning I can't do both, um, the answer is, actually, if we look at Phil's screen, if you highlight this base image um, right up here, yep, perfect. Um, so there's two reasons. One, the container, so you're going to have a base image that is going to have all of the, like the copies of .NET Framework and things like that that are designed for the host operating system. And the reason it's in either or is you will actually, in some cases, have to have, a, you have to have a different base image dependent for whether you're going to run on Windows or Linux. And so it's possible to, um, Okay, yep, so I think that's what I'm, and the question came back in. It says, the question is regarding the pop-up where the distribution was chosen, why not select both Windows and Linux? Um, and so the answer is kind of what I'm talking about right now, that you, one of the nice things about containers is they have this concept of layering. And so that means that y it's not your responsibility to figure out how to get .NET Framework in there. Mm -hmm. You are going to be able to pick a base image that you inherit from, just like inheritance in programming, that um, is going to have the copies of .NET Framework that's designed to run on the host OS. And so yes, so the base image is going to be either Windows or Linux because .NET Framework, the, the, or the .NET Core runtime that is actually going to run we is has a lot of native code in it, and it's compiled either for Windows or Linux. And so your base image, you need to know: Am I going to run? Like, do I need the copies that are going to run on a Linux host OS or a Windows host OS? So switching between Windows and Linux can be done, but you're going to have to pick a different base image, and you're going to have to maybe flip a couple different settings. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually made this really, really easy in the case of .NET Core. You can go into uh, Project Properties, and you can flip the target OS. We don't need to necessarily do that right now, but you can pivot back and forth. Um, but the answer is, the reason you can't do both at the same time is you actually have to know which one you're going to compile and use and package into that container, depending on the host OS that you're going to run on. Yeah. And on Windows, you can target either Windows or Linux, because there is a Linux VM that's going to run inside Hyper-V that will host your Linux container if you want to F5 locally. Um, so Great. Thanks. Sorry, I just wanted to, to address that. All right, so you're going to show us now how we would publish this. And I think uh, one of the concepts that you're going to talk about really probably early on is a concept of a container registry. Yeah, so a container registry is an online store of images. Now, each of those images you can think of as the actual packed up file uh, from the, the Docker tooling that is the one file that is uh, going to be the, the application that is run with all of its dependencies. And the container registry is a place to store them all. So if we were to go in and the, go into the standard Visual Studio publish, to a, publish UI, and there's a bunch of Azure options, uh, one of them is a container registry. And you can create a new container registry. And you can think of this new container registry as a folder where you would store these images. And you can also select an existing container registry, which is to reuse one. And so as an organization, you might say, these are, this is the place we're going to post all of our images. Or you could say, I want to create a new one. Depends upon how you want to run things. We're going to go through the create experience, because you have to have created one in order to select one later. So I'm going to click Create Profile there. It brings up this UI that's going to enable us to create this container registry, this kind of online folder, we could call it. Um, 
it has to have a name. Uh, I will actually remove uh, some disambiguation text. It's going to be the Cloud Tools stand up. Um, it's going to be part of one of our subscriptions just for demo purposes. And we're going to host it in Western US because it has a physical, has a, a physical location, uh, so to speak. And uh, that's going to have implications on my latency, right? So yep. we're sitting here in Redmond, Washington. West US should be close to us. It, if we, it will be closer than some of the other options yeah. in the dropdown I've just if opened. If we pick, say, Europe, means we're actually pushing all of those bits from here to Europe rather than all of those bits from somewhere on, you know, hopefully within a couple hundred miles of us. A absolutely. And if I were running a service that was then going to refer to that image, I would want that service to be closer to the image because it will have to download it and run it. It'll have to do a Docker pull, in effect. Um, and I think I want to talk a little bit about maybe while you're creating that. Um, uh, so I'll hit create. Things are going to create off. And you talked, so you talked about the idea of a container registry being a sort of glorified folder in the cloud. Yep. You talked to me a little bit more about what that's going to enable for me. So you can then refer to the images in that container. So again, it's a folder. You can think of the images as files. Each of those images can have um, kind of subversions, which are referred to as tags. And a really common tag people use is latest to say, I want the latest version of such and such an application. Uh, but when your application is going to run, if it doesn't already have the image or has whatever the semantics are around refreshing, it will then say, oh, this is the container registry I need to talk to. This is how I'm, this is the name of the, uh, the image. Here's the tag on it. Again, latest is really common, so people can just automatically get the newest version. It will then pull down that image to that machine and then start running it, running the application within it. Yeah, and I think a couple of things worth teasing out there again, kind of that, that you talked about. So I think the point, it's a, a way of sharing images mm -hmm. that have a really well defined protocol over it that optimizes for getting a specific copy of an image and like writing and reading updates from it. Just like Git is a protocol, and then obviously GitHub is probably the most popular implementation that actually you know, has a cloud provided service that supports that protocol. But much like source control or Git specifically, everything operates on differentials in a container registry. So unlike if I think about sort of a standard share where I might publish my application, if I just zipped it, let's call mm -hmm. it, put say a zip file for now, I would probably have a specific cop, like I would have a one zip file per copy of my application, even if 98% of it was exactly the same over time. And that base image would be a good example of that. And, and one of the really nice benefits that a container registry gives me is the first time I push an image to it, it's going to be big because I have to push the entire copy of the image. So if it's 112 megabytes, I have to push 112 megabytes. Mm -hmm. But then all subsequent up, uh, updates to that image, to your point, tags give me versioning, which would be the, kind of the equivalent of commit hashes in GitHub. It just so happens that I can name them as opposed to creating a commit hash. And and latest is equivalent to head. Yeah, automatically. And latest would be equivalent to head. Um, one of the nice things is then the next time I push an update to that container, uh, if it only changed by one megabyte, it's only going to push and pull one megabyte to and from the service, as opposed to the need to actually push and pull the, what did I say, a full 112 megabytes of the image. Which, so container registries are, yeah, a really nice way to share things in a way that after that initial commit makes it really lightweight because you're just dealing with deltas. Very cool. So here we are back in the, <clears throat> uh, we usually refer to this as a published profile inside of Visual Studio. This is the container registry we want to publish to. Um, I uh, briefly showed for people who are watching carefully the edit image tag. We can actually generate one automatically based upon the date and time, or you can use a custom tag. Again, latest is really common. So that is our default. I come in here. We click publish. It's going to actually compile the application for release. Um, and then it's going to start running that uh, set of commands that were in the Docker file. This will take a minute or two. But I want to show you the usage on the other side of things, which is, that if we come into the Azure portal and we want to create a new app service, 
And this would be a typical way in Azure to make use of a Docker image. As we say, add a new app service, we grab the, the web app template. I'm going to go through these couple of steps really quickly because the goal is to show the container registry integration. Come in here and I mark the same uh, subscription so I can find it. I go and I say, I want this published to come from a Docker, Docker image. There's a configure container option down here, and I can actually make this a little bit bigger for people. A little too big. Uh, configure container, and then it will come over here, and I say, I want Azure Container Registry. And if you remember, we called that the Cloud Tool Standup Registry, and there it is, and that was created just as we were doing it. And then for the image and the tag, we'll actually have to wait for that publish to finish. Um, but that is how you would be able to list them and, and set them up. So, and so I think what that means, if I pin myself to latest, for example, anytime I then want to update that tag, if I push an update, to the latest tag, the service will automatically then pull that image tag. Correct. So anytime latest gets updated, it's going to know that, and it's going to automatically pull that latest updated, so I don't have to come back in. Correct. And that is one of the advantages of using latest uh, when you want to make an update that you know is ready for the set of servers that are using that exact image. Perfect. And I think, so in this particular case, it's worth pointing out that you used App Service as an example, because App Service is probably generally the easiest place to get started with in Azure for all of this stuff. Um, but you could do it in any service that supports containers. The great thing about containers is they're a standard unit of delivery. Docker doesn't care what's inside the container, right? You can, it could be Node, it could be Go, it could be Python, it could be .NET. And um, it just knows that it's going to run a container. and so you, any, once you get it up into that container image or container registry that you showed publishing from Visual Studio, I could say, I want to have a Kubernetes cluster. And I could drive it from the Azure CLI, and I could just point at, in the manifest file, I simply need to give it a URL to that container registry and make sure that there, basically it has, the Kubernetes service has permission to read the images from the container registry. And so it could pull, or I could use Azure Container Instances. So anywhere that supports containers, once you get into a container registry, you can put it on any hosting environment, App Service obviously being the easiest example to get started with. Um, perfect. So I think the last thing that would be worth briefly just talking about a little bit, because it comes into play when we talk about the differences of the services, and you hinted at it a little bit when you were talking about how to add container support, is the idea of container orchestration. Mm -hmm. So what does an orchestrator, so, so obviously in Visual Studio we have the option for you know, just add Docker support, which does this, like just Dockerizes my project. But then there's this other option that says orchestration support. So what is the difference between Dockerizing a single project and working with an orchestrator? So the orchestrator will let you, so there's, there's two of them. One is the Kubernetes Helm and the other one is the Docker Compose. So Docker Compose will actually create another project in your solution and let you gather up the contents from multiple projects and put them together, even if they don't have a direct dependency where one, ex one has a DLL and another one has a DLL and there's a project reference between them. Well, that naturally should be part of the, the publish of the, the downstream project. But with Docker Compose, you can say, I have a whole set of things that need to all come together and therefore they all get pulled into the package together. Okay, so I was actually thinking maybe a little different. Compose, so the nice thing about, big thing about orchestration is it lets multiple images work and talk together. So that's, that's the, that's from my particular experience more the other end of things, which is I have a set of machines that have different roles. I want those different roles to have different images. I want the, different roles to be mapped to effectively different Docker images and tags. And the orchestrator is the thing that says, I need three machines of this role with this image, with this tag, and I need five of this. And yeah. I want to make sure I monitor the health of them, and here's how I check the health, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely correct that that's all built in. I think, so yes, you. The, it's an and, not, 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 a, not an or. The, the two aren't contradictory. But I think from a sort of a basic benefits perspective, like that's a very operational and you're absolutely correct. Um, I was thinking one of the more sort of tangible benefits for why I might want to use uh, container orchestration even locally on my local machine is it enables multiple containers to start and then enables them to discover each other via URLs. So 
in that Docker, mm. in the Docker Compose file, you name each of your image, each of the images that are going to be spun up. And so whether there's one instance or whether there's five instances of it, um, I have a relative name. So if I want have a you know web front end and a web API back end, I can just call it web API back end. And when I call that, if that's how I try to call it for my web front end, the orchestrator will do the DNS resolution for me and let me discover that. And it'll, to your point, if I have multiple instances set up, you know, it'll automatically handle the load balancing and the routing and things like that. But the nice thing from a developer perspective, instead of having to hard code or add URLs into config somewhere, it's just relative. So if I'm developing locally and doing name-based resolution behind, doesn't matter if it's Docker Compose or Minikube for local Kubernetes Helm, when I deploy that to production, nothing about my code or configuration needs to change, assuming that the relative names of the containers stay the same, so the services. So that mm -hmm. service discovery is a really nice benefit, that orchestration. And then as you said, all the operational benefits. So I think operationally, yes to everything you said. <laughs> Locally, if I'm developing, the reason I may be interested in, instead of going with the single image thing, doing the compose flavor, is if I'm trying to have a couple services talk to each other, I can do that in exactly the same way locally I'd be doing that in production. Um, so I think I don't see any more questions online right now. We'll give people maybe about 30 seconds to type one in if they're, uh, they have anything else they'd like to ask. Um, but other than that, I think it's, we're kind of approaching the end, near the end of the hour, so let's plan on wrapping it up. I'd like to thank Phil uh, for joining me today, for spending the time to, to chat with me. Thank you for the opportunity. I think one of the, opportunity, one of the great things about stand-up is you know kind of an informal thing you know tend to be Microsoft conferences or more formal things we tend to send oftentimes the same people all the time where stand up gives us the opportunity to get some people who are maybe more behind the actual bits Phil does all of the hard work I just get to stand on stage and take credit for it more regularly <laughs> um, haven't seen any more questions come in so with that we will uh, call it a wrap thank you everybody thank you